So I'll just stay out of the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kobe, uh, for having me back to Atlanta. And I have presented for Data Finch before, and it's always a very enjoyable experience, and I'm glad to be here and glad to have some faces in the room to look at, as well as um, the people online. Um, so there were a couple of questions that have already been sent in, which is wonderful. They're primarily about error correction procedures and mastery criteria. I will cover that towards the end of the presentation. And so if you submitted those questions and my coverage doesn't fully answer your question, please resubmit and um, I'll make sure that I clarify um, anything that you might need some additional information on. So let's get today talking a little bit about, uh, I'm going to try to approach this in two ways. The first is I want to cover conceptually some things in the area of stimulus control that explain why it might be important to teach in some very specific ways in order to achieve a repertoire for our learners that is actually the repertoire that we want. And I'm going to then translate that into very applied, what do you then do? in order to design your programming in a way that achieves that stimulus control. So we are going to talk about the conceptual basis and then we're going to talk about best practice guidelines for receptive language instruction in kind of a do this, do this, do this, do this fashion. So the person who uh, is listed on this with me is Dr. Laura Groh. She is a faculty member at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. She was a graduate student of uh, mine at Western Michigan University. And she and I, for many years now, have talked about um, this issue of stimulus control and practices, particularly in receptive language instruction. So this um, presentation is primarily based on um, a paper that we published in Behavior Analysis and Practice. That's a journal that I really like because its purpose is to translate what we know about how to do things well for practitioners. So that manuscript is available for download as uh, along with some resources including um, data sheets that you might use. So let's get started. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why this topic is important. Um, when it comes to the specific procedures that, of, of what we do, what we do is quite precise and it is easy to do it not quite right and difficult to do it exactly right. But the differences between a program that's not quite right and a program that is exactly right translate into substantial change for our consumers. So we have to kind of view it as our responsibility to use the most effective and efficient teaching strategies because our original literature on the effectiveness of ABA with children with autism was based on 40 hours a week for two to six years at young ages. And even under optimal conditions, we typically do not get that volume of services. So that means we have to use what our science has taught us about how to do more with less in order to produce those same transformative results with fewer hours per week. So a second thing that I will keep in mind is that we need to teach optimally because the old adage is that practice makes perfect and practice does not make perfect. Practicing errors makes for a horrible mess mm -hmm. and potentially very entrenched faulty stimulus control that can be very difficult to fix. Perfect practice makes perfect. Whether what you're doing is learning to speak or play tennis or piano. You do not want to practice lots of errors because you then have to undo perhaps some of that faulty repertoire. So I encourage people to think about um, themselves as an agent of change and the learner and their repertoires and rate of acquisition as the indicator of how well we are doing. So when you think about evaluating your teaching procedures, ego aside, look at the data and the learner and their repertoires are your data. So with effective teaching, if your teaching procedures are optimal, what you should expect to see 
is independent and accurate responding, rapid rates of acquisition and decreasing trials to criterion across your targets, a high probability of reinforcement, which typically translates into a very happy learner because they are having a very high rate of success. And so there is usually minimal problem behavior with the exception that sometimes stereotypy persists. So on the other side, these would be indicators that your teaching procedures are not yet optimal. Um, there might be high error rates, so 20% accuracy would indicate 80% wrong, and that's a very high error rate. Uh, prompt dependence and passivity, which often comes about as a result of error correction procedures where um, things go better if I just sit and wait for you to, through all of the first stuff before we finally get to something that actually indicates how I should respond. Typically you'll see a low rate of reinforcement and then that will often translate into increasing trends in problem behavior that you then have to develop some work around. So interspersal of maintenance tasks so that at least you can get a reinforcer for that rather than the reinforcers for the things I'm actually trying to teach you. So, um, you know, think about as you're designing your programming that this is telling you something. And it's not telling you something about that learner, it's telling you something about your teaching procedures. And then that gives you the opportunity to affect change in your teaching procedures. So let's talk a little bit about this notion of stimulus control and stimulus control and autism. So here's a basic definition of stimulus control. Stimulus control essentially means a stimulus readily evokes or alters some dimension of a behavior. That's pretty basic for behavior analysts. This is one of the first things that we, um, that we learn about, um, that when we are presenting a stimulus, it may become, if we do it right, a discriminative stimulus that evokes the responses that we would like to see. Here's the thing, when we are working with children with autism, faulty stimulus control is so common that it kind of is the norm. Um, if, if it can go wrong, it will or it already has and you just don't know it yet. And so that is an assumption that if it can go wrong, if your teaching procedures are not optimally designed, any wiggle room, any not quite right could lead to faulty stimulus control. The wrong thing is evoking responding or nothing is evoking responding and in fact you are not establishing these things as discriminative stimuli the way that you might hope to have done. So this is so pervasive that uh, Dr. Joe Spradlin in 1999 uh, kind of wrote a, a, a book chapter that it, uh, describes what uh, is, he refers to as the stimulus control theory of autism. His notion is that all of these core deficits and um, uh, kind of excessive behaviors that we see in autism can be brought back conceptually as the reason they occur is because of stimulus control failure and stimulus control for the wrong kinds of things. That that's really the core deficit for a child with autism. So given that, our job as teachers is about manipulating antecedent events and stimuli in order to establish stimulus control. So we are always trying to do the one thing that is potentially the most difficult thing to do for a child with autism. So first let me say, all of you out there are working with children with autism or adults with autism, and I applaud your efforts. And throughout my entire career, I have been working and striving to try to become more effective at exactly that. I hope you are doing the same. There is a very good chance that as we go through some of these procedures today, you will have a hand to the forehead moment of, oh my gosh, why haven't I always done that? Or why didn't my professor teach me that I should do it that way? I have had exactly those same experiences. And so I encourage you to just be happy about the fact that maybe it makes sense to do it another way and move forward. And just be excited about potentially making change and moving towards better stimulus control for your learners. Okay, so 
You know, much of what we have been taught to do in our programming is based on the original development of what has been termed discrete trial training that came out of the work of Ivar Lovas in UCLA, uh, his program from UCLA. So some, some people call this UCLA model programming. Um, some people call it discrete trial training, but that me book was the curriculum and the protocol and the teaching procedure that many of us in some derivative form have, uh, have been taught. That original book was published in the early 1970s. I think it was a 72 or 73 publication. There is an updated uh, manual published in 2003, but the discrimination training and particularly the receptive language programming is virtually identical to the programming that was in that 1972 book. We have learned so much about stimulus control <laughs> since then. A phenomenal amount of research has been done uh, in the area of stimulus control and stimulus equivalence. A majority of that research um, is based on the work of uh, Dr. Murray Sidman, one of the absolute giants in our field. And uh, much of that work was done at the Shriver Center and New England Center for Children. So this is a practice research partnership in New England. And um, just so many studies have been done on optimal stimulus control. However, a lot of that literature has not made its way into everyday practice for those of us who work with children with autism. Gina Green published a paper in 2001. Um, much of this work is, she synthesized in that paper. Um, but that paper was not in a behavior analytic journal, and I think many people may not have encountered that paper. And so we determined that it could be useful to have a modern publication in a behavior analysis journal, particularly for practitioners, that lay out very clearly some best practice guidelines that incorporates all of this that we now know about stimulus control that we didn't know in the early 1970s when these protocols were originally developed. So one of the things that we have learned um, is that there are really two types of discriminations that we need to talk about and we need to think about those types of discriminations somewhat differently because if we try to teach them identically, we do not get the two types of discriminations. We get a kind of a mashup of the two without having effective stimulus control. So the first is a simple discrimination, and this is probably what most of you think <coughs> most things are. Um, this is a discrimination with three elements. It's that three-term contingency, the discriminative stimulus, a behavior, and a reinforcer. That's your A, B, and C. So this is our basic three-term contingency. A lot of the things we teach actually do have these three terms. Things like um, oral naming or attack, expressive identification, you might call it. You see something, you can say the name of what that is. It's a cup, it's a computer. Instruction following, you hear the discriminative stimulus, you engage in a behavior that corresponds, stand up, sit down, and there is a reinforcer for that. Then there are conditional discriminations. Conditional discriminations have matching as a basis for their response. So when we kind of teach matching, when we teach, I'm going to say the name of it, and you find the one of these things that matches what I just said to you, that is now not a simple discrimination anymore. It's a little more complicated. It's a conditional discrimination. And a conditional discrimination actually requires multiple con simple discriminations simultaneously. So it's much more complicated. So it's multiple simple discriminations and conditionality. So that means this response is the correct one and will receive a reinforcer if and only if there is an additional specific stimulus. So let's take a look at this, just as an example. You see this number, and someone help me participate. 
you say four, that's exactly right. You say four and you get a reinforcer. So this is in fact your antecedent, this is your behavior, and I think you're delightful. So there's your reinforcer. <laughs> okay, so here's another one. It says this, these are lovely Brazilian people who study stimulus equivalents, and uh, we're eating our lunch, and so we did it, and in fact it was delicious, and that was our reinforcer. So those are simple discriminations. But a conditional discrimination has a conditional stimulus. That conditional stimulus establishes something as the discriminative stimulus and the other ones as not the discriminative stimulus. It has the behavior and the reinforcer. So some of these things like identity matching or object picture correspondence, I show you an apple and you find the picture of the apple. Um, or object text correspondence. I show you the apple and you find the word apple. Or I say the word apple and you find the word apple. Um, so many types of our receptive language. I say something and I'm teaching you to look at these options and find the one that is. Those are conditional <laughs> discriminations. So a matching repertoire is integral and it is in fact more complicated. So let's take a look at what is called match to sample to kind of illustrate which of these might be which kind of stimulus. So this, um, this framework is typically called match to sample and you have a sample. So that's this thing. And then you're going to have comparisons and one of them matches. So of these, you have a conditional stimulus. This must be present in order to establish this as a discriminative stimulus and the response of touching that one instead of the others as correct. These comparisons are not right. Not on this trial, but they may be right on another trial. So this is important. There is that conditionality. Touch lion when and only when there's a lion up here. Touch heron when and only when there is a heron up here. So we also teach, in fact, most of what we teach is what we might call non-identity matching. So that means this thing is here. And we're picking something that is not a form match. There is not an exact duplicate of the shape. Sometimes it takes the version of the printed name. So this is your conditional stimulus. It establishes this as a discriminative stimulus and pointing to that one as the response that will receive a reinforcer. Now let's take it one more step. By the way, these glorious graphics, you'll see they're like kind of so-so graphics, the ones that I just showed you, those are mine. Then there are these, which are Laura Gross, and she um, has beautiful graphics. So whenever you see something gorgeous like this, assume it's hers. Um, okay, so now let's take that to list, um, the receptive language training that we're gonna be talking about. In this instance now, you've got an array of these visual comparison stimuli. So those are your comparisons. And you're going to present that sample, but the sample isn't there to look at. Instead, it's someone's auditory stimulus. Orange or yellow. So I say that word, red, blue, orange, and that establishes one of these as the response that touch that one and I will get a reinforcer, and the others as the not. Does that make sense? So there's a conditionality here. Um, and we do a lot of this kind of teaching with children with autism. We may be teaching them shapes, colors, the names of things, that things have wheels, that things are tall, that things are animals, all of those kinds of things. When our language needs to evoke their selection from potential comparisons are conditional discriminations, not simple discriminations. 
if we try to teach them as simple discriminations, we increase the likelihood that we may end up with faulty stimulus control. Remember, if it can go wrong, it will or it already has, and you just don't know it yet until you get to the point where you are saying red and the person is consistently pointing to green and it's clearly not red, but you almost can't undo some kind of faulty response. And you think, where did that come from? Where did that come from? And you find out if you analyze from a functional perspective that somewhere along the line the child learned by a reject relation. So that is, that green was the not blue. <coughs> So I know when they say blue, I don't pick that one, right? That's the not that one. And so when something new came along like red, oh, it must be that thing that was wrong before. So that has actually come to be the stimulus control rather than your language, red, blue, or green being the thing that controls responding. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about conditional discriminations. As I said, they're more complicated. So when you are doing conditional discrimination training, the learner essentially has to discriminate each sample, that's the one at the top or the thing that you are saying, from every other sample across trials. This one at the top versus next trial, a different one is at the top or is said. They also have to discriminate each comparison from each other comparison within the trials. That's all the ones at the bottom. And so if they're not attending to all of them, they're not scanning that array, could they possibly discriminate those stimuli as this one for this word and this one for this word and this one for this word? Probably not. So you begin to see how the attending repertoire could really increase the likelihood that something goes wrong in a conditional discrimination. They need to match each comparison with one and only one sample. The one that is fluffy is the lion, and it is the only one that is the lion, and you should only pick the lion when that word uh, lion is spoken or that matching picture is there. So, here's what it might look like. Here is my sample. Here are my comparisons. That's the right one. On the next trial, have to discriminate that the sample varies on trials. Now the sample is a different one. This and only this is the correct one. And in fact, on the next trial, now this is the sample differing from the previous two, and this and only this one is the correct response. So it, when all of that occurs, the conditional discrimination has been made. This is important. When we talk later about teaching sets together and mastery, you, what you are teaching is these things as corresponding to one and only and not the other. So you are teaching that this is a horse and it is not a lion or a heron. You are not only teaching that this is a horse. So that full discrimination, that full conditionality means when and only when this sample or spoken word is presented, select that one. So, this is the paper. As I said, it's available for download. This was published in uh, Volume 6 of Behavior Analysis and Practice and covers the material that we're about to go through. So, when we talk about receptive language, um, depending on um, the framework with which you do your instruction, if you follow a verbal behavior framework like Barbera or Sunberg and Partington, you may use certain kinds of names of your programs. Things like receptive discriminations, receptive identification, receptive by feature function in class. A lot of times receptive language is also referred to as listener responding within that framework. Leaf and McCacken and Lovos 2003 are UCLA model programming. They use slightly different uh, names for their programs, things like receptive labels, receptive ID. Here's the most important thing to take note of. Regardless of which of these curricula you use and what the names of the programs are, 
these ones at the top responding to your name, instruction following, those are simple discriminations. I say Mary, and that evokes your head looking up and where'd that sound come from. I say stand up, and it evokes standing up. All of these are conditional discriminations. Matching somehow is the basis of responding effectively in these programs, and they should be taught as conditional discriminations rather than as simple discriminations. We'll revisit that notion as we move along. But this is an example of how a lot of what we do, we may have been thinking about a little too basically from the perspective of stimulus control. So, as I mentioned, why do we think we needed this paper? First, we thought it was appropriate to synthesize the literature in a consumable form. Much of this research from the last 30 years on stimulus control is published in journals like JAB, the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior, Psych Record. <coughs> it tends to use some terminology and preparations that, can, that are unfamiliar to practitioners. We wanted to synthesize that research in a way that generated best practice guidelines that were very consumable and get the work into a behavior analysis journal for practitioners. So, in terms of the scope of use of this paper, <coughs> the first thing is that we are talking about listener responding. That encompasses both simple and conditional discriminations, and these best practice guidelines have been designed to be um, pertinent for whether you're teaching responding to instructions or responding to your name, or whether you're teaching conditional discriminations. So the, the, the best practice guidelines have been synthesized to a level where you can apply them to, both, to all of these types of programming. The other... Um, types of conditional discrimination. So um, the specifics of this paper are, are about receptive language. I say it and you respond. But the same premises hold true if what you're doing is visual, visual matching. I show you and you find it. So you can extrapolate these best practices to those other kinds of programs. When you're doing identity matching, um, let's say a picture-based man training system, um, when you are kind of getting to um, that phase three and are teaching this picture goes with this potential reinforcer and this one goes with the other, um, same kind of best practice guidelines can be applied for that programming. Final thing I want to make clear to you is that these best practice guidelines are most important with early learners who are just beginning discrimination training. It is not that it's not a good idea to keep doing your training this way, but <coughs> discrimination training is often one of the first things that, you know, it will occur in those first three to six months of working with a, a young learner. And if you don't have this kind of discrimination training optimally designed, you can produce a very faulty learning repertoire. And primarily what can happen is you teach your learner not to attend to what the teacher says. Just watch for clues. What you looking at? Where's your hand? Which one's on the right? So essentially the focus of their attending is to a variety of these extraneous discriminative stimuli that are now evoking responding. So when a learner is learning how to learn those first discrimination training trials, it's critical to get it right, to get them to attend to the things that we would like to be meaningful. Over time, you can perhaps um, a, a little bit more variability in your programming is, uh, will produce less problems. But very early on, it's really critical to design your programming just exactly right. Okay, so we're going to talk about five best practice recommendations. The first is to require an observing response. The second is to minimize those unintentional instructor cues, remember? If it can go wrong, it will or it already has. 
The third is the most complicated, but that's about arranging those antecedent stimuli and the required behaviors. If you're doing something like instruction following, arrange them very carefully. So we will talk in detail about all of the things that you might do to ensure that you are arranging your antecedents in order to establish the right stimulus control. The third is to use effective prompting and differential reinforcement procedures. The questions that have already been submitted were in this area, so we will talk a good deal about different prompting strategies and what I'm going to call a probe and prompt uh, technique for your prompt fading. And then finally, troubleshooting stimulus control problems. Sometimes something still will go wrong or sometimes you are the second provider for a consumer, which is always makes me sad because someone else has done that early discrimination training and a big part often of what you have to do is try to unravel the mystery of how this learner's repertoire got the way that it is. And very often it is because those early teaching procedures were establishing faulty stimulus control. So if in fact that's where you find yourself, troubleshooting those stimulus control problems to determine how to fix them and establish an effective repertoire for that learner uh, is the fifth best practice guideline. So let's focus on each. First, let's talk about the observing response. So an observing response essentially is when the learner emits a response that results in sensory contact with the stimuli. So prior to engaging in the response that will eventually be reinforced, the observing response is a behavior that the learner does that um, brings them into contact with the sensory stimulus. And so um, often this is kind of a, it, it's more than just a get ready behavior. So when you are doing motor imitation training, the thing that you want the learner to do is see the behavior that you are emitting so that they can do it. And so very often we will prompt, look at me, and once they are looking at you, then you, then you emit the model that will subsequently need to be imitated. If you emit the model when the learner is not looking, it cannot possibly evoke subsequent responding because it does not exist as a stimulus in the environment. So the observing response is something that the learner does to bring them into contact with that, sense, with that stimulus. Now, there is a second version called a differential observing response. When you can do it, this is actually even better. So now what happens is, this is an observing response, except the learner's response varies depending on the stimulus. Okay? So let's say we're doing um, trials where I've got an array of stimuli and it's listener responding and I say, which one has wheels? The learner now has to echo my question, wheels, and look at the array. The fact that the learner can echo my question or a part of it increases my confidence that they heard the stimulus because they now can engage in that behavior and repeat it. If they can't repeat my question, I cannot be very confident that they actually heard the question or attended to the critical auditory components. So, when you are doing this kind of programming, you should embed in your program some kind of observing response. Let's take a look at what this might look like. It will vary depending on your program and your learner. So, um, for motor imitation, what you want them to do is look at you and see what you do. So, the look at me is an appropriate observing response. However, if what you are doing is a matching program where the stimuli are on the table, looking at you means they are attending to the wrong stimuli. And so you're looking at me and that increases the probability that you're gonna be watching my eye gaze, that you're gonna be watching my hand movement because you're looking at me instead of looking at the things that I hope become the discriminative stimuli. 
So for matching trials, rather than look at me, you should have an observing response such as scanning the array, where you prompt the learner to put their finger out. The, the finger being out simply should just correspond with their eye gaze. It gives you a better way to track what they're looking at, and they move it across the whole array. Another thing that you can do is have them touch that sample. Again, it just increases the likelihood that the gaze has actually been looking at that sample. Could be they touch each comparison. You could even have them uncover the stimuli. But it increases the likelihood that they're observing the stimuli that now we can say meaningfully exist in their environment and have the potential to become a discriminative stimulus that can subsequently evoke behavior, such as finding red when the word spoken is red. So for listener responding, um, it's a little bit different. So now I'm going to say something, and then they're going to respond to a visual array. I'm going to say red, and they're going to touch the one that is red. So what might be the observing response? Well, there are a couple of things. The first is they should only respond after you've presented the auditory stimulus. Any responses that occur before you said red could not possibly have been evoked by red because it did not exist in their environment before. And yet, when a learner has had some not quite right programming, you will often see that as soon as there's an array, they start touching stuff, right? When people put the stuff in front of me, I touch something. And maybe, and so which one's the right one? Well, my language could not possibly have established one of them as the right one yet because I haven't presented the conditional stimulus, right? You're not presenting an SD. You're presenting a conditional stimulus that establishes something as an SD. So that hasn't even occurred yet. So the only thing that could be controlling responding is the one I've been reinforced for the most, the one in the position that often works for me, or a variety of other extraneous sources of stimulus control. So first, the listener should listen and only begin to respond after you've said the, um, the verbal stimulus. You could also have them do a differential observing response where they echo the target. I say red and you say red and point to one. If you, now you would only do that with a learner who has a bit of an echoic repertoire. If your learner does not have an echoic repertoire, you're obviously not going to pick that observing response. But you might have them wait and you might have them uh, indicate that they're responding only after they've heard it by there is, let's say, a white square. I say red and immediately after I say red, you touch the white square. You heard that I just said something, right? If you can't echo it, I don't know that you can emit all of the stimulus features, but I say red, you touch the square, and now there's an opportunity to find the one that is red and not blue or orange. Okay. So you should absolutely put into your programming that you would only reinforce responses that occur after the antecedents are presented. So here's what that might look like. This would be a differential observing response. I say blue and there's no array out there yet. You can't pick one yet because it's not out there. The child says blue and now I present the array and the child scans and points to one. Okay. This is another option. White square, I say red. When the child touches the white square, these become available, and now the child can pick red. So they're touching a white square just to indicate, I heard, right? That's kind of the, yep, I heard your response, and then the other stimuli become available. So let me pause just for a moment to see if there are any questions about the observing response before we move on to minimizing those unintentional instructor cues. With the learner echoing any part of the discriminative stimulus for an observing response and leading to reinforcement, inadvertently reinforce echolalia. 
It might, however, keep in mind that the reinforcer will not come until after the behavior of selecting. And um, so it's possible that you could get a chain, but often echolalia is um, maintained by the fact that th something sounds appealingly just like a thing that has been said before. So it could happen, but it's not as probable because you're not differentially reinforcing echolalia. You're simply presenting the trial contingent upon duplication of the uh, auditory response. Okay, but if you have a consumer who does, has a lot of really peculiar vocalizations and echolalia, you might want to go with a kind of response of touch the white square instead of echoing if you are concerned that something like that might occur. Okay, for auditory visual programs, if the learner does not have an echoic repertoire, what other observing responses are recommended? So we talked about maybe touching the white square. You can also um, have it covered if you want to make it more fun for your learner. So let's say there's a cup on the table and you say the stimulus and they flip the cup over or then get to uncover the, um, uh, the array of stimuli. So a variety of those kinds of things where they emit a behavior after and only after you have presented that conditional stimulus. So let's talk about unintentional cues from the teacher. Oh, goodness. I, you know, I see on your faces, yep, this happens. We don't want it to happen. We all do it. And that is an important thing to keep in mind. It, you know, essentially, we are unintentionally prompting the correct answer and a child getting the correct answer is highly reinforcing to us and thus our behavior can be shaped without our own ability to describe that it is happening in that we do things that increase the probability of this learner that we're working so hard to teach getting it right. So here are some examples, um, and particularly when you have array-based programs, but also when you have those simple discriminations that are instruction following. Um, one would be looking at the correct item in the array. So that is you put it down and just give that little, just, a, you know, making sure, like, which one was it? It was red. So you look at it, and that visual stimulus of your eye gaze evokes responding. So I just wait until you look at it and then I pick that one. And it can look, wow, this learner is really, you know, in rapid acquisition. They can get it. But in fact, you're saying red, blue, green is irrelevant to their responding. It's not a discriminative stimulus. Your eye gaze becomes a discriminative stimulus. When you put the items out there, people might uh, often, they look at their data sheet and it's like, okay, this one's a red, so they put that one down first and then they lay out some comparison. So no matter where you put it, all the learner has to do to have a 100% chance of their behavior being reinforced is, watch what you put down first. It's like the cup game, right? Once they put the cup in, don't look at anything else. Just track that one, just track that one, just track that one. So. The, if it's put down first or last. And what happens is, you know, human beings, we, we devolve to patterns. Our behavior settles into patterns for those things that are easiest and quickest for us. And when we're doing this kind of teaching, we're trying to get a lot of trials in. And so we do things that help us be more efficient. Like that is always remembering what the target stimulus is because that's the one you want to reinforce and not the others. We might repeat it to ourselves. We reorient to it. We put it down. Um, uh, this is one I have seen. We put that one down, especially if there's blocking for errors, we put it down on our non-dominant side. So I'm a right-hander. I put the correct one down with my left so I can be a super ninja on the response block with my right. So now, how would I possibly know that I do that? Because I did it a lot and it went badly and then my learners couldn't respond and I watched video of myself and start, and I could see my arm get ready. 
So it's like I'm putting it down and my arm's already up, right? So now I try to be an efficient person, that pattern is going to evolve. So most of these patterns evolve because they somehow make us more capable of implementing some other part of the program that could be designed differently. How about this? Tone or pitch of voice when we're, um, could be that you're saying, stand up, sit down. So it sounds different. I could be saying, uh, bubble, top. And the child would be standing up and sitting down because it doesn't actually matter what the content of my vocalization is. It's the intonation that is, in fact, evoking responding. So, you know, Skinner says any stimulus that co varies as an antecedent with a high probability of reinforcement can come to control that responding. So you're, uh uh, uh uh. Co varies 100% of the time when you're saying stand up and sit down. And thus, it, there is stimulus control established by that. Okay. And yes. Along, okay. Question. Thank you. Okay. In the last example, touch the red ball. Should we have them attend to stimuli or teacher first? Um, okay. So it's an auditory stimulus. Um, I would probably have them attend to the stimuli. So that is, um, I say red, and then the learner's observing response is to scan the array, so I make sure that they look at all of them. That might be the observing response, but not necessarily looking at me. I um, try to avoid having a look at me as the observing response for uh, listener responding programs because there is such a propensity for your own physical behavior to inadvertently control responding. Um, and so the more you can divert attention away from that and to the critical stimuli, um, the better. Thank you. Okay, so Skinner says, stimuli that accompany or precede responses that are reinforced come to influence them in important and complex ways, and we don't have to have meant for that to happen, right? We don't have to have ever intended for putting it on the left side to be the thing that controlled responding. The environment comes to control responding whether we meant it or not. So this is really about making sure that the visual stimuli in the environment don't trump your verbal stimuli. And it is always the case that they might. It is much easier to attend to a constantly present visual stimulus than an ephemeral auditory stimulus that's gone two seconds after your eardrum is no longer vibrating. That is the thing about an auditory stimulus. It's there and then it's gone. So if you want that auditory stimulus to control responding, one of the other things that the literature tells us is if you emit the auditory stimulus and the learner doesn't respond pretty quickly, repeat the auditory stimulus or else it doesn't exist anymore. So the stimulus has to accompany or precede the response or it could not possibly later evoke that response due to stimulus control. Okay. So if your learner is not responding pretty quickly after your auditory stimulus presentation, repeat it. Don't repeat instructions, repeat conditional stimuli. Red, red, red. So after someone says something, the reason that you and I can continue to respond to it after a while is we echo it to ourselves. We behave covertly in a way that makes that stimulus continue to exist for us. Children with autism don't until we teach them how to do that. And we will not have taught them how to do such a complex kind of problem solving response of keep echoing it in your head until you respond when they're such an early learner. So we may need to actually repeat that stimulus. Otherwise, your, all of these visual things like your eye gaze and your body positioning are present and um, they more immediately precede the child's response and are more likely to control that responding. Okay, 
So there are a few things that you can do when you're doing these kinds of either array-based preparations, conditional discriminations, or simple discriminations like stand up, put it on the table, um, you know, raise your hands. Couple of things. Return your hand and body to neutral. Second, keep your face neutral. So that is actively think about not, you know, hot and cold game. You're, you know, the aspects of your facial expressions differentially reinforced. So it becomes a little bit of Ouija. Ouija board, got it. There's my smile. Um, and keep your eyes on the learner instead of the stimuli. So you teach your teachers to say it, put them out there, and I'm looking back at you. I'm watching you because you're what's going to behave. You are what I need to notice. That's what I'm watching. I direct your attention to the thing you need to be watching. Otherwise, it's exactly backwards. I'm paying attention to what you ought to be paying attention to, and you're paying attention to what I ought to be paying attention to. Right? Learners looking at the teacher, teachers looking at the stimuli. We want it exactly backwards. Okay. So you want that teacher to kind of practice until they're fluent without those unintentional cues. And it can be a challenge to get to the point where you're not kind of moving your arms. This is one that I've seen. So I, you know, we say, I say, stand up. And I change my posture. I don't stand up, but like that is a change in the visual stimulus that could inadvertently control the stand up, right? Or turn on light. So just a little bit of my body orientation and like those things creep in very quickly. So practicing to fluency without those. You can do this not only by having them practice, but have them watch video of others and detect it. You can even make the training videos that include some of this, get them to the point where they can readily detect it, and have your therapist during training experiences watch each other and try. So essentially what you're doing is you're establishing those unintentional behaviors as discriminative stimuli so that they catch it and then change and eliminate it. Okay. So even once someone reaches fluency, periodically check for drift. And learners who might have the hardest time tend to be the best shapers of our behavior in the wrong ways. So that is that we start you know, becoming variable to try to get to the a little bit more success. And that variability very often can corrupt our stimulus control. And then this is a recommendation straight from Green 2001. Prepare your materials out of view. So you can use printed arrays. You can arrange them in your lap and put them all down at the same time. You can do it on a computer. But they can't possibly pay attention to the which one did you put down first or last or what have you if they can't see how you're arranging them. So preparing your array to present out of the view of the learner eliminates those visual stimuli as potential sources of stimulus control. OK. Really good Great. Thank you, Kobe. Um, OK, so I think <laughs> the next question is, how do I feel about the learner self-correcting during these conditional discrimination tasks? So I think what that means is I touched red, and then um, before you could um, say no or what have you, I switched to blue. Um, my preference is always to start with a clean trial because the self-correcting can evolve into scrolling. Touch one and part of the way it does is that we are differentially responding, right? So it's like try one and if the praise doesn't come immediately, switch it. So if there is too much of a delay, so when you, or actually when you have a teacher who gives those very immediate reinforcers, a little bit of a delay in the response means, hey, you got it wrong, right? And so now the auditory stimulus isn't present. I just switch and pick one of the others. So my preference is always pull those stimuli back, represent the auditory stimulus, get an observing response, and ha now go perhaps to an errorless trial where you um, prompt the correct one immediately. Okay, 
Would repeating the SD twice e teach them they don't have to respond the first time? Um, it's possible, although let's think about probability of reinforcement. So I say red, and if you pick red, reinforcer's immediate. I say red, and you wait. I say red again. I say red, you pick one, you get the reinforcer. So an efficient learner will respond quickly because it means they access reinforcement more quickly. So again, you're not altering what you're doing, you're simply repeating the stimulus. So over time, what our behavior does is it can shape behavior, it can also shape dimensions of behavior. If you are only providing the reinforcer for a response that occur occurs after that auditory stimulus, that response should start to become quicker and quicker. So you are shaping short latencies to responding because that produces more immediate and quicker access to the reinforcer. So the learner could just wait and wait, and if you're not using an effective prompting strategy, you might get that. So repeating the auditory stimulus and having the right prompting strategy kind of have to go hand in glove in order to get to optimal programming. So we'll talk more about prompting strategies as they come up. Do I recommend repeating the auditory stimulus a certain amount of times before prompting? We'll talk about that. With errorless, what will happen is you emit the auditory stimulus and immediately prompt. You do that for several trials and then you begin to introduce a delay or change your prompt so that you emit the auditory stimulus, delay perhaps one second, two seconds, emit the auditory stimulus again and move to your prompting level where you might point to or gesture. Okay, oops. So now let's talk about arranging the antecedent stimuli and the required behaviors. This is perhaps the more complicated part of this. Um, so we're gonna spend uh, some time uh, in, the, in the details on this. So we'll talk about each of these five. The first is to plan the required behaviors and to introduce and teach the targets simultaneously. So, you should introduce multiple targets, particularly for whether it's for simple or conditional discrimination <laughs> training, simultaneously. So, I am going to say it and I'm going to repeat it. No mass trials. No mass trials. There are three exclamation points after this. <laughs> Mass trials teach a learner that you should do what you just did, do what you just did, do what you just did, do what you just did. We do not want to teach learners to not pay attention to our discriminative stimuli and just do what they just did. Because as soon as the target changes, you not only have the prior target that supposedly was mastered, you now can't teach the second one because they're trying to do what they now have a ton of reinforcement history for doing what they just did and you now need them to do a different thing. No mass trials. So you want to generally introduce a minimum of three targets at the onset of training and you want to exit them together. Remember, discrimination is about what is and what is not. Standing up is this, not all the other stuff. <coughs> Red is that one and not these other ones. So you might do following three different directions. Touch the table, raise your hand, stand up. You might identify three common objects from an array. Could be a boat, could be a house, could be a swing. But always introduce as sets. There are multiple reasons, but essentially what you're doing is minimizing the likelihood of the wrong stimulus control. So you're minimizing the do what you just did so that only the first discriminative stimulus in a block of trials matters. When you do mass trials, let's say you do 100 mass trials. The learner may not attend to the first stimulus. You prompt them to do some behavior and they encounter reinforcement for that and then they do that a whole bunch more. 
there was never a discriminative stimulus that was meaningful that evoked responding. And you could do hundreds of trials with no meaningful discriminative stimulus, which is never what we want to do. We want every learning opportunity to carefully, to be carefully programmed to include that three term contingency. We want our stimuli to matter. Okay, so it minimizes the likelihood of encountering reinforcement for just doing a behavior that was recently reinforced. It also minimizes um, what is often called the reject relation or switching. So sometimes people don't do mass trials, but instead they do two in the array. And as soon as you get it wrong, you know what you should do? The other one. Pick the other one. So the first one matters, and the second one's just the other one, right? That is certainly the kind of preparation that will lead to a learner immediately shooting a finger out there and then waiting for it, because either I get it right quickly or I immediately switch to the other one and then I get it right. This is why I don't like it to reinforce responses after a switch. But if you have at least three in the array, it minimizes blue being the one that's not orange. So that is when there's only two and you are targeting just one of them, but there's a distractor, the other one becomes the one to not pick. So now when you try to actually teach that one, a lot of times you can't get the learner to pick that one because that's the one that's always wrong. That's the one that never gets me a reinforcer and always gets me an error correction. And I was never attending to the auditory stimulus anyway. So if you get this learner and you're like trying to teach them something and like you practically have to physically guide them to pick that one, you're like, why, why won't he ever pick this one? It may well be because that one was always a distractor in as a, a you know as the not one in s teaching some other prior target so you want to introduce all three of the targets together you want to teach them all at the same time so that they are learning this one goes with this auditory stimulus and not the others this one goes with this other auditory stimulus the third one goes with this other auditory <coughs> stimulus so all right here's the thing I know we have all been taught to mass trial, particularly in discrimination training, because the program that started it all is a mass trial program. So here's the thing. Um, in 2003, there was an updated version of, the, of Lovasa's book. The discrimination training program remained the same but there was now four pages of troubleshooting for all of the faulty patterns of stimulus control that you are likely to have to fix. So the program's about a page, page and a half. The fix it is more than twice as long. So, you know, uh, even when you do it just exactly according to the protocol, you can establish faulty stimulus control. So here are the most common patterns that are described. Scrolling, right? Switching, win, stay, do what you did before. On the last trial it was red, so no matter what you say on the next trial, I'm picking red because it just worked for me. That behavior encountered a reinforcer. Lose, shift, it wasn't red, so I just go to the other one super quick. Or side bias, go for the one on the right because this, this teacher just happens to all, often put the right one down on the right side because maybe they're left-handed or what have you. So all of those are such common patterns that it describes them and how to fix them. And I believe every person in this room and online has worked with a learner that has had at least one, if not a whole bunch of these patterns. When these patterns develop, essentially the learner has learned to not attend to your auditory stimulus. So it is absolutely critical. Your job is to make sure that the auditory stimulus controls responding on every trial. That auditory stimulus then has to vary on every trial. And with mass trials, it doesn't. 
you can just stop listening and still get a reinforcer. So you want your auditory stimulus to be uniquely associated with the given behavior and reinforcer. Okay. Okay. Um, does it still count? Does it still count as a verbal prompt if you have to repeat it? Okay, so we will talk a little bit about a prompt versus a discriminative stimulus in just a little bit. A discriminative stimulus is the auditory stimulus that should control responding. Red a pro or cow. A prompt is an additional stimulus that is introduced that is not the discriminative stimulus. So when I say cow and that doesn't work and I say moo and now you pick the one that you've kind of learned the little song with, that's now a prompt. Repeating cow is an additional presentation of the discriminative stimulus. It's not an additional extra different thing. Okay? Okay. Um, why do we need to close out the set of three at the same time? Okay, this is a good one. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But remember, what you're teaching with the ray-based programs or with any discrimination is that it is this thing and it is not those things. So if you master out only one, it is not the case that the learner knows that Standing up is this behavior and not these others. Usually, when you master one and the other two are still low, what is happening is the learner's always emitting the one behavior regardless of the auditory stimulus. So no matter what I say, you stand up. 100% correct on stand up. I love that, except stand up doesn't mean anything to you. You just always stand up. and so. You've got to keep it as a set because that's the only way to kind of ensure that the full discrimination has occurred. A discrimination occurs when the presence of the discriminative stimulus evokes the behavior and the non-presence or some different stimulus does not evoke the behavior. If all stimuli evoke the same behavior, there is no discrimination that has occurred. So you master them out once they have all reached mastery because now each of those auditory stimuli are associated with one and only one response. Okay. All right. So Gina G Green gives us some instructions on how to carefully arrange these stimuli. First, Vary the sample, that's my auditory stimulus, or maybe that picture in the matching array, the top one. Vary the sample equally within the block, but keep the comparisons the same. Whoa, wait a minute, the distractors matter? Yes, because they aren't distractors. They are meaningful potential responses that will be associated with one of those samples. So we're not teaching people to just always ignore those other ones, whatever it is in the array. We are teaching a conditional discrimination. So keep the comparisons the same. One of the things that that does is it minimizes responding away from a novel distractor. So if you're constantly changing what you have as, let's say, the distractors in the array, if the, if the thing you say is the same, pick the one that's familiar. If the thing you say is different, pick the new one. You might as well call it new one, right? Red, blue, new one. One you haven't heard before. Something else. Anytime you could use another phrase besides the thing you're hoping to control responding, and it would also produce that response, you're not programming a discrimination. The discrimination's based on novelty, and so you want to minimize that stuff. That's faulty stimulus control creeping in. So introduce them as a set, master them as a set. Don't master one out and then introduce a novel thing into the rest of the array because you will 
likely establish that as new ones. I mean, if you want to call it new ones, <laughs> go ahead. But that's kind of what's going to happen when you suddenly change out one of the targets and leave the others in. Okay. You want at least three comparisons on every conditional discrimination trial. So why three? If you have one thing that the learner could touch, what's the probability of a reinforcer if you touch something? 100%. Just do what you did. Just touch something, right? Regardless of what I said. If there are two things in the array, what's the probability of a reinforcer if you just randomly stick your finger out there and touch one of them. Got a 50-50 shot. With three, you now drop it to 33%. Your chances for reinforcement are better if you attend to the auditory stimulus than if you behave randomly. Every additional one in the array after that drops the probability on chance responding and shifts learner responding to attending to the auditory stimulus because it increases the probability of reinforcement and contingencies shape our behavior. Okay, so Murray Sidman, who did a lot of this work with very impaired uh, adults with intellectual disabilities and then much of it was replicated with children with autism, he often used uh, seven to ten stimuli in his arrays. He had a big apparatus and the stimuli would kind of be in circles and the person could touch them. So he was able to use so many options in the array he wanted to do so because it really drops the probability of that adventitious reinforcement chance responding produces a reinforcer. However, he had an apparatus that made it so that all those stimuli could be presented simultaneously easily. And very often, we're putting stuff out there. So three is about what you can control easily with your hands and do a good stimulus presentation. But if you can manage four, if you're doing it on a computer, if you're printing the stimuli out on a piece of paper, <coughs> four, five, all of those will drop the probability of chance responding inadvertently leading to faulty stimulus control. <coughs> So vary the sample equally, have at least three comparisons, <coughs> random variation, and I actually prefer counterbalancing the sample presentation within the block. So that's the order of your targets. And then random variation, I prefer counterbalancing in the placement of the comparison stimuli within the block. That avoids positional bias of the right one just ought more likely happens to be on the right side and so the learner starts always pointing to right and doing so leads to a very high probability of reinforcement. So let's talk about what this looks like. So we've got our lion, here's our sample, trial one, here's our comparisons, they will stay the same on every trial. Now the sample has varied, the position of all three stimuli has varied, the position of the correct one has varied. Next trial, new sample, it's still the same comparisons, the position has changed, the position of the correct one has also changed. 33% shot on any stimulus, 33% shot on any um, position, but if you attend my auditory stimulus and respond accordingly, 100% probability of a reinforcer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this notion of, well, what if you introduce, and, and I've often gotten this question, so, you know, you describe this, this produces optimal stimulus control, but what if it is a learner who really has difficulty learning? Shouldn't you mass trial then? Absolutely not. That is, in fact, the worst time to do it because that learner is the one who is going to be most likely to not to have faulty stimulus control. So let's talk a little bit about a couple of studies that have been done comparing what is called the sequential model. Teach one, then teach the other, then teach the other, and then finally teach them all together versus the simultaneous model, which I just described 
introduce all three at the same time, vary those stimuli. So the sequential method is the protocol that's kind of described in the LOVAS manual. And um, it is also sometimes called the blocked trial procedure or mass trial. The simultaneous method is what's recommended by Green 2001, and I'm going to talk with you about this study and one that's in press that e evaluates um, this procedure. So here's the sequential method. You may have done something like this. Touch blue, touch blue, touch blue. Every trial, touch blue. Blue's the only thing out there. Don't touch it. You could just say, touch it, touch it, touch it. You probably could also just put it out there and look and the response would be identical and it wouldn't get a reinforcer. And the second one, we're going to touch red, touch red, touch red. We're touching some red. <coughs> touch it. Probably all going to evoke the same response. Now we're going to have both red and blue. And this might be where we start getting a little, what am I supposed to do? So now there are two stimuli out there, but it's always going to be the same target. Touch blue, so you know what you need to do on the next trial? Do it again. Do that again. Repeat that. The one you just did. The one you just did. The one you just did. Now we're going to switch, and it's red. Red, the one you just did. Red, so now blue is the respond away. Right? Here, red is the respond away. Now we're going to move to step five. Uh-oh. This is where it can often go really, really wrong. Because now my auditory stimulus needs to control your response. You can't just do the one that was first reinforced. <laughs> I say blue, you need to pick blue. I say red, you need to pick red. I say red, you need to pick red. And if I say blue, you need to pick blue. Often, if the learner has not been attending to your auditory stimuli, this is where you're going to start getting the switching. Right? I try something, and if that doesn't work, it's the other one. And then on the next one, I try what just worked. And if that doesn't work, switch it. Step six, I'm going to now introduce a third one. We're going to go orange, orange, orange. Do it, do it, do it. Now I'm going to teach orange with blue, and, and we're switching back and forth. Blue, orange, blue. We're going to do um, orange, orange, red. And then finally we get to step nine. I say blue, you find the blue one. I say orange, you find the orange one. I say red, you find the red one. Okay. This is the sequential method. With the mass trial, and then mass trial with the distractor, and then integrated trials. So that's the sequential method. The simultaneous method is this. From the very beginning, I say orange, you touch the orange one and get a reinforcer. I say red, you touch the red one and get a reinforcer. I think I just lost my battery. Oh, nope, I got it back. <laughs> I say red, you touch this one, I say blue. Stimuli uh, the, um, for the trial are varying. Response has to vary. Positional placement varies. So this is what we just talked about doing. Let's look at some data. So Grow It All 2011 um, did this study to compare these two methods. So essentially, I was telling Laura in her autism class, you need to do this simultaneous method. That's going to be better stimulus control. And she said, okay, that's great. Is, are there any studies that directly compare these two? And I had to say, no, but do it anyway, because Linda told you to. <laughs> but then go do a study so that I'll know if I'm right or not. That's kind of often how the science of what we do goes. Conceptually, this makes perfect sense from a stimulus control perspective. Of course you would do it that way once you think it through, but let's get some data and actually see if it is the better thing to do. So for her dissertation, that's what she did. So here, to orient you, we have percentage of correct independent responses. We have sessions and maintenance probes. The open squares are that simple to conditional. 
blue, 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 red, 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 blue, red, blue, that kind of thing. <coughs> the school closed squares are the simultaneous method. Red, blue, orange, blue, orange, red, alternating, and three are introduced simultaneously. So keep in mind, nine, step nine for the open circles is what every single trial with the squares looks like. You're simply starting on step nine and then arranging your targets in a very specific way. So what we have is a race to the finish. And what we see is very high performance in the early steps. So you can see when you get to step three, there's a little bit of a drop. Why is there a drop? Because now I'm going to miss some of them. Right? I got to figure out which one's right, and that immediately drops my percentage. If it's 10 trials, I missed the first one. And if I missed the first one, and you correct me, now I'm going to keep doing that. So you see a little dip with three, with four, with five, with seven, but once you get to eight and nine, where the auditory stimulus is varying every single time, you see a huge drop. With conditional only, you see that it takes a little longer to get responding going. These two actually make it to the finish line at the same time and have maintenance. So this analysis was done with several consumers, several sets of targets. So what I'm going to show you is one more target. Here is where, here's the simple to conditional. Here's the conditional only. Conditional only gets there first and they never could get simple to conditional there. They couldn't get the learner accurately responding on all of them, and so they um, had to, go, they tried to fix it. They tried to fix it, so they couldn't get past step five. Remember where I said sometimes step five was, might be where it all goes awry? Because now for the first time, we're alternating trials, red, blue, blue, red, so you have to attend in order to get it right. So they never could get past step five, so they switched to step nine. Now we're gonna just switch to the other method, right, of conditional only, and had to add in some additional error corrector, uh, correction, and finally we're able to get them there. So those are the kinds of patterns that were observed. Here's a synthesis. So this is the number of sessions to the mastery criterion. Here's the very first two sets that we looked at with Aaron where they got there in about the same amount of time. So slightly fewer trials in the conditional only, but that's really about the same. Now here's the thing. By the second set with the same learner, now we've got new targets, conditional only gets there in about the same amount of time, but look what happens with simple to conditional. Something was established as a faulty pattern of responding, that now means we can't get you there. It fell apart at step five. Similarly, with step three, we see the same, it took longer. Now with another learner, first one, it's, the, it's equal. Second one, we start to see a little bit of a discrepancy with the simple to conditional taking longer. By the third one, simple to conditional takes much, much longer and they couldn't fix it. So this is where you get to that learner who has these error patterns like scrolling and side bias that you can't overcome. Third learner learned equally well in both. And this learner is what shapes our behavior to think it doesn't matter which method you use. <coughs> it matters for the learners who might have a little bit more difficulty learning. And those are the ones we really have to get it right for. Okay, here's the follow-up data. So you can see in some of them you get the same. I do think I'm gonna need oh, yeah. some new batteries, yeah. So in some of them you do get the same maintenance. With others you get better responding in the conditional only. So here's what you have to think about when you start seeing that pattern where with every new set of targets, it takes you longer to learn them rather than with every new set of targets, it takes you 
less time to learn them. You're, they're not learning to learn, they're learning a faulty strategy. So you have to think about, did I teach a strategy? So an instructional history of that sequential method can promote faulty stimulus control, which is why there are those well-identified patterns that you might have to troubleshoot and fix. So what Grow It All did was an analysis of the potential um, uh, sources of stimulus control that the Lovos 2003 <laughs> curriculum describes. So that's the Wednesday lose shift. And what they found was exactly those problems developed and they were very likely to develop in steps five and nine and that the learners made more errors and worse errors over time. So often there would start to be multiple strategies that they would use. Here's an example of what, we, what she called the molar Wednesday error. All right, fresh electricity. Thank you. So with this one, it's win stay. So in step four, um, you say red, but it doesn't matter. You could say do something. But I touch red and I get a reinforcer. So I do that again, red, red, and it's working like a charm and I look like a rock star. I'm doing it, win stay, win stay, do some more, do that again. Now we switch to step five and I'm still win staying. So you say blue and I circle, I, or I select red, because I have this history where, right, red gets a reinforcer, stick with it. So I continue to stick with it. Across my trials, what's my percent accuracy? 50%. In a selection-based preparation with two <laughs> options, 50% doesn't mean you're getting there. It means there is absolutely no stimulus control, right? You could always pick exactly the same thing and never have the auditory stimulus control you're responding at all. So this is what we call a molar win stay. So do the response that was reinforced in the last step. This is what's called a molecular win stay and it can be even stickier. So I say orange and you pick orange and you get it right. So now on the next trial, no matter what I say, you know what you're going to pick? Orange. But I error correct you to red because I said red. So you know what you're going to pick on the next one? Red. Do what just worked. Right? So I error corrected you to orange. Next time you picked orange, I error corrected you to red. Next time you picked red, I error correct you to blue. You know what you're going to pick next time? Blue. And sometimes that happens to be the next target. <laughs> Boom! That differentially reinforces the win stay. This is a very detailed analysis to find this kind of error pattern but she absolutely found it, and she particularly found it with those learners where she couldn't fix the target set. She could never get them to effective stimulus control of her auditory stimulus. So this stuff's hard. This stuff's complicated, and if it can go wrong, it will, or it already has, and it's so complicated you can't notice. This is the side bias. Whatever's over here, that's what I'm going to pick. So we're still in this one of arranging the antecedents and required behaviors carefully. You know, it's important to also, if, even if you're doing the simple discrimination of instruction following, program those behaviors and stimuli carefully. So remember, they're a set. You're discriminating one from the others and each one from the others. So for example, the stimuli that you put in your array for the very early trial should be quite different from each other. So a snake, a bird, a dog, they sound very different. They don't have the same beginning or endings or vowels and they don't share a lot of physical features. This one's all swirly. This one has wings and this one has four legs. They look different, they sound different. Later we can move on to that harder discrimination of all of these have four um, legs and a tail and they all have an O. 
ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. So if you're not attending to the entire auditory stimulus, all of these might sound more similar to each other. So thinking about what are my auditory stimuli, how do they sound, how do they look, because you're going to be attending to that array. If you're doing instruction following, avoid opposite actions. So don't teach stand up and sit down in the same set, because you know which one you should do? The one you're not currently doing, no matter what the person says. If you're standing up, you probably ought to sit down. If you're sitting down, you probably ought to stand up. So what does that mean? It means that a very salient stimulus, your own body position, 100% <laughs> co-varies with the auditory stimulus, which is what we're hoping will control responding. And Skinner says, antecedent stimuli that proceed or co-vary with the behavior that gets reinforced can control that response. So my body position is a whole lot more discriminable to me than some sound that somebody said 10 seconds ago that I wasn't listening to anyway, right? Whatever you're doing, do the opposite. So you don't wanna put those opposites within your target. You ensure or increase the probability that your auditory stimulus is in fact the thing that can control responding. Arms up, arms down, light on, light off, that kind of thing. So it's really about thinking about the set as the set and as the things being learned from each other. And once things are mastered, you can put them into a larger set. Okay, so let's talk about counterbalancing the array. This is about, with those conditional discriminations, where you put stuff. It is very important to rotate the targeted items across the comparison position in the array. Left, middle, right. And it's very important to rotate the position of the correct stimulus, that, which now is the discriminative stimulus. That's the one I point to and not the others. Or else you're going to get that side bias. Here's the thing. You cannot, with at least three um, targets, three items in your array, you're not going to wing it and actively balance so that there's a 33% chance that each stimulus is in each position each time. You're not going to do that live and on the fly. It's too complicated. You essentially have to remember 27, if you're doing a nine trial block, three stimulus, you have to remember 27 positional placements and that the correct one is varying, right, and shows up in each spot three times. That's hard. I, I couldn't do it. So what I recommend is you have to create a system. And I know how important it is. Hopefully I've convinced you it's important. I still couldn't do it because it's hard. So you want to create a system that ensures that your therapist or teacher rotates the stimuli correctly. Make it easy to do it right. So this is how I do it. Um, if you're doing listener responding, program the three behaviors, clap hands, stomp feet, touch toes, and what you'll see is they're rotated in order. Each one is in here three times, right? This is a selection. So it's a picture of someone coloring, bathing, or dancing. And what you'll see is the bolded stimulus is the correct one for that trial. That's what I say out loud. And it tells you what position each one goes into. So what you'll see is coloring shows up on the left side three times. It is the correct one in the left position exactly once. Bathing shows up on the left side three times. It is correct on the left side exactly once. Similar with dancing, <coughs> similar for each position. You can't make that up on the fly. But you can look at the sheet and do coloring, bathing, dancing, prepare my stimuli and say, bathing. Make it easy to do this counterbalancing correctly. Okay. So here's the thing. You could potentially still get a chain if you always did exactly this counterbalance where always pick the middle one first, right? If you can go wrong, it will or it already has. So this is actually three versions starting on different targets, 
starting with the correct position. If you rotate through these, you will minimize those kinds of error patterns developing. Okay. So we're going to move forward to the, and again, this is about arranging your antecedents carefully. So another critical part. Do you have time to hit a couple questions before you move on? Yeah. I'm really falling on. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Would use of multiple exemplars from the beginning, pictures, objects, etc., prevent some of the potential errors in learning? It certainly could, like if you had different pictures of dancing, some, you know, this picture of dancing, that picture of dancing, the other picture of dancing. It could, but really the critical part is, is the learner attending to the stimuli and to the auditory stimulus? So it won't solve the problem of I say dancing, but there's only one picture to touch because you may not attend at all to the fact that I've said dancing. It's not necessarily a bad idea to have minor variations in your exemplars, but very important to actually target as a set. Can you provide some more information on exiting the set and what this would look like? Yes, we're going to talk about mastery um, and exiting the sets in just a minute and how you do your data analysis. Okay, the other one's too long. I kind of can't read it all at once. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so for providing clear and concise instructions, this is the, the part that is pertinent really to listener responding to receptive language where your auditory stimulus needs to evoke behavior. Your discriminative stimulus or your conditional stimulus if it's an array or your discriminative stimulus if it's instruction following. The thing you say should be brief and clear and contain the relevant information. Don't add in a bunch of other stuff or you introduce what I call the where's Waldo aspect of the programming. I'm gonna say six words and one of them matters. You see if you can figure out which one. So all that unnecessary information can lead to faulty semester control. So let's look at this. And I have absolutely seen people do this kind. What I'm trying to teach you is colors red green and blue and what i say is show me the red one show me the green one show me the blue one my auditory stimulus is 80 percent identical on every target 20 percent different <coughs> the 20 percent is all that matters that's the underlying stuff let's say a bunch of stuff you figure out which part matters right so get rid of all the other stuff Stand, red, big. What is the stimulus that I want to evoke to responding? If it doesn't matter that they touch it, show you, put with, then take that stuff out. If you want to teach a child that touch means something different than stack, we'll teach that. But that's your auditory discrimination. Right? Say touch, and whatever's out there, they need to touch it. Say stack, and whatever's out there, they need to stack it. Now that auditory stimulus matters and is meaningful. If what I'm teaching you is read, point to, touch, show me is irrelevant. What should evoke your responding is the red. So get rid of all of this where it's going to be the same across every single trial except for one word and you got to figure out which one it is okay let's talk about prompting and differential reinforcement so i think this is where several of the questions have come from so if what i'm about to say doesn't uh, answer your question you can put in a repeater so effective prompts and fading so keep in mind prompts particularly response prompts are what we're typically doing. Those are additional behavior by the teacher that increase the likelihood that the correct behavior will occur. It's not the conditional stimulus or discriminative stimulus. It's extra stuff that we do. It's the movement, right? So when my arm is moving, that's not the conditional stimulus. It's something extra that I did that came to control responding. So it's a prompt to behave this way instead of that way. Now, the kinds of prompts that we intend to put in there are typically verbal, gestural, or model, or physical. 
And so if what we're doing is instruction following and we want someone to stand up, typically our prompts are going to take the form of gestural, model, I stand up, or physical, I pick you up. Okay? If it's an array, it's often going to take the form of I point to it, so I gesture, I model and completely touch it, or I physically guide you to touch it. Those are prompts. You can put them in sequence, and we typically arrange them in a sequence to go from least intrusive to most intrusive, or most intrusive to least intrusive. The original kind of UCL and model programming programs least to most. So you may have heard that called least to most programming, where you go through a verbal, maybe a gestural model and physical guidance. You can also do what is often called most to least. So you start off with the most assistance that is required to produce the correct response and then back out your prompts to the least, um, to the less intrusive. So <coughs> with increasing assistance, least to most, over years and years and years, here is what uh, we know about this. The great news is each trial provides an opportunity to respond at each level of the prompt hierarchy. You could get it on independent with only the discriminative stimulus. You could get it with only a gesture. You might get it with a full model or a physical guidance. You only have to implement the higher level prompts if they don't get it right on the earlier level. So you might never have to get to that physical guidance. but. There are some very clear drawbacks, and people have already asked questions about, yeah, but isn't this going to happen? It will if you use least to most. This kind of prompting procedure ensures frequent errors. In fact, it's often called trial and error teaching. I'm going to say it, you give it a try. If you get it wrong, I'm going to show you how to get it right. If you get it right, we'll move on to the next one. Trial and error. Those frequent errors often mean that there's a very low rate of reinforcement and that the child's hearing a whole lot of no, 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 Let's try again, no, try again. And in fact, they may hear no, try again a thousand times more than they hear any supposed discriminative stimulus. So no, now occasions, switching. When you hear no, pick the other one. No means the other one, which in fact, it kind of does in a two item array. So those frequent errors will often lead to prompt dependence. So I just try something and then I wait, do I hear the no? And if so, I try the other. Now, most to least, the amount of assistance gradually decreases across trials and you're starting with a pretty in there kind of prompt. This is often called errorless because the learner starts off with you showing them how to get it right every single time. Right? You are providing the prompt level that ensures an accurate response on every trial. Red and show, yes, it's red. Blue and show, yes, it's blue. Green and show, yes, it's green. It's just a heyday of reinforcement. In fact, you arrange the teaching so that they almost can't get it wrong. I mean, they could physically pull away from you to pick another one, but they'd have to work awfully daggum hard to get it wrong. So what that does is it builds a substantial learning history where that conditional stimulus and the correct selection results in reinforcement before you back out your prompts and the behavior could occur independently. So this results in a high rate of reinforcement and it means you don't need to intersperse maintenance tasks. So one of the things to keep in mind is Throughout the later 70s, 80s, and 90s, discrete trial teaching with a whole lot of errors can produce some um, problem behavior. 
<laughs> so we had to come up with different strategies to try to fix that. One of the ones we came up with was errorless procedures, most of least. Another was task interspersal. So that is, you're getting, making so many errors on the stuff I'm trying to teach you that I'm going to intersperse some stuff you already know so at least you can get a reinforcer, right? So then that decreases the aversiveness of the teaching, but the reinforcers aren't coming for learning new stuff, right? So if you use this kind of teaching procedure, you're looking at a reinforcer on almost every trial. You don't need to do task interspersal. There's already a super high rate of reinforcement. So here is the general recommendation. It may shock you to know this, but this paper was published a long time ago, like the 90s. Assess with least to most probes. That lets you know what level of prompt is required because you get to see at every single prompt level whether the child could get it right, but then teach with most to least trials. Quick assessment to figure out what prompt level you need. Now teach with that prompt level, please, and then reassess. So errorless learning procedures rather than trial and error is the recommendation. Try to use errorless teaching procedures as often as you possibly can, particularly with the very earliest learners that are likely to make a lot of errors and likely to not have that effective attending repertoire. Fade the prompts quickly and effectively. So probe and teach. I like to probe, if there's three targets, nine teaching trials. Three teaching trials with each target, probe again. You pretty much can't go much faster than that. So probe each target, right? One trial least to most with each target. Figure out what prompt level you need. Nine trials, that's three learning trials per target. Probe again. That's a pretty rapid way to detect if you can prompt fade your prompts. Okay, so a second way to do it is with time delay. So that is you're always using the same kind of prompt but you start delaying the presentation of that prompt. So initially they're simultaneous. Green and a point. Right? Green and a demonstration. And they, they're, they're presented simultaneously. And then over time, green. And eventually the child beats you. So they emit the correct response before the prompt. That is another option. Here is the not option. And again, oh, we only have two. Um, exclamation points after this, but I am all caps screaming it at you. This is how I was taught as well. Don't use positional prompts, right? Red and blue, red's closer on the red trial. Blue's closer on the blue trial. What now 100% co-varies with the behavior that leads to reinforcement? It's closer. It doesn't matter if I say red or blue. I don't need to attend to that nonsense. Pick the closer one. In fact, you could say, closer. <laughs> if you could change your auditory stimulus and they could still get it right, your auditory stimulus is irrelevant. So we do not want our behavior as a teacher to be irrelevant. So don't use positional prompts. You're introducing a visual feature of the environment that 100% co-varies with the behavior that will be reinforced, and it's not your auditory stimulus. Okay, so if you follow this approach, it is going to reduce or eliminate errors. It's going to really increase your rate of reinforcement, which tends to minimize problem behavior. Here we go. It decreases the overall instruction time. Let's look at the most recent study. This is in press, in Java. Grow, Kodak, and Carr replicated that of previous study. So you're looking at the percentage of independent responses. We have our circles, which is simple to conditional. And essentially, this is the low loss protocol. Simple to conditional, least to most prompting. Now, the squares, it's conditional only errorless teaching procedures. Exactly what Green 2001 recommends. And guess what? Race to the finish every single time. 
the conditional with errorless results in fewer sessions to, mas to mastery. Now this is important. This is important. We have to teach thousands of things, thousands of them. Would you rather it take you that much time to teach each one or that much? We are always racing against time. We never have enough time. Remember I said we don't get 40 hours a week for two to six years? Remember I said we got to keep figuring out how to get more with less? This is how you get more with less. This is the original protocol. This is based on what we now know 30 years later about stimulus control. Okay. Do more with less. So with a probe and teach session, I mentioned probe, then teach. So with the probe, you're going to go, um, you know, just I say cat. Then I do cat and a gestural, cat and a partial physical, cat and a full physical. And I'm going to circle the prompt level that was required. Now I'm going to use that to teach errorlessly. So if I circled full physical, every one of these trials will be full physical. If I circle gestural, every one of these trials will be gestural. So I will not have an opportunity to get independent responding until I get a probe that's independent. But I am going to have 100% of responses that are correct and prompted. There's going to be a lot of reinforcement. Then eventually I'm going to, in these probes, get an independent. Now that becomes differentially reinforced. Once I start to get independent responses, I'm only going to reinforce the independent responses or I'm going to reinforce them more powerfully than a prompt in response. <coughs> Changing the differential value of those contingencies shifts responding to independent. So here is where I might write down, is this version, do, should you do this as your first, second, or third iteration? Remember I said you got three versions? This is where I'm going to write down the percentage independent on the probes. So if all three of them are an I, that's 100%. If two of them are an I, that's 66%. This is where I'm going to write the percentage correct for the teaching trials, and the teaching trials may or may not be independent yet. Okay, so what about your mastery criteria? Okay, first, I guess just remember to please use a preference assessment, use powerful reinforcers. Use your preference assessment to identify two levels of reinforcers, and then once you start getting to independent responses, use either higher magnitude, more of it, higher quality, more preferred, or a denser schedule. FR1 independent responses, some VR or delayed for the others. Multiple studies suggest this kind of differential reinforcement works. All right, data analysis and, and maintenance. Analyze for the set. Remember, you're teaching the discrimination of a thing and not these things, right? So 100%, here is what I typically use for a mastery criterion. You can use whatever you want. 100% independent, correct on probes. Each one of them, you got it the first time. And I typically like to see that across days. And I typically like to see it multiple sessions in a row. Could be two or three or four. I also track responding on the trial blocks in order to do an error analysis. If I'm seeing you stuck at 66%, you're responding away from one of those three. You're never, ever getting it right. I have to figure out how there's a reject relation that creeped in. That allows us to do that error analysis and detect trends. Let me just show you real quick on the, if you start seeing, what I typically do is on this trial, cat's the correct one. That's where you place it. You circle what they picked. And later you can go back and determine whether that was an error or not. Because if the bold one's not circled, it was wrong. Right? When, if you start seeing 
60, 70 percent of your circles right here. You know what you got? Side bias. Our therapists find side biases for us within a couple, three sessions. And they bring it to their clinical director and we fix it. Make it easy to find a problem if it creeps in. Okay. So, once you have mastered the set, you got those three. You got red, you got blue, you got green. I'd probably do something like red, blue, and yellow, as different as possible. Then you're going to combine your known sets to mastery. So that is, you mastered red, blue, um, green. You mastered orange, purple, brown. Now I'm going to put all six of those together and rotate through those trials in an array to mastery. Okay? So I don't only want you to know that red is not blue and green. I want you to know red is red and it's also not orange and yellow. But putting in, let's say, those colors that have some uh, similar features to the hue is a harder discrimination. So I want you to have already had a very long learning history with selecting that stimulus as being red while the others are orange. So, you know, you can make a version of that counterbalance data sheet that's six items in the array. Now you've mastered two of the sets, I put those in. Okay, let's look at this last area of recommendations. Troubleshooting stimulus control problems. In spite of your best intentions, even if you do everything that I've recommended, you will have fewer stimulus control problems. You will have more rapid acquisition. But it still could be the case that something can accidentally creep in and go wrong, and it might be the case that you are not the first provider. <coughs> That's usually when you're going to see a lot of stimulus control problems. So what do you do? Well, the first thing, you know, particularly with these kinds of conditional discriminations, I've had children come to me, they've been through multiple providers, you try to get them to go to the table and they start engaging in self-injurious behavior. I, I work with people with substantial problem behavior. Or they'll go to the table and as soon as you lay out an array in front of them, they swipe it off the table. Here's that I'm supposed to where's Waldo, something you're saying matters. And I pick something, I don't know which one, but I know there ain't going to be a whole lot of reinforcement. You know there's going to be a whole lot of? No. No. Try again. No, and I want none of it, right? And I will behave in a way that's going to eliminate that stuff. So <laughs> when that happens, to be honest with you, you need to get rid of all of that stimulus control because now you have a whole lot of stimulus control. You not only have faulty stimulus control, the table is discriminative for failure, error correction, low rate of reinforcement, and miserable, boring, I never get it right. But I know what I do get a lot of, touch your nose, interspersed tasks, do this, right? That's the only halfway decent stuff that could happen at the table, and I've done it 20,000 times. Hmm. We can do better than that. Do more with less, but let's say you get to, like with some of the learners in the studies, where there are targets that somehow got corrupted. Maybe they were the comparison when something else was taught, and so the child responds away from it. You just cannot get them to pick the fox or whatever it is you're teaching. If that's the case, you know, plenty of kids live their lives without being able to pick out a fox in a lineup, so get rid of the fox. Discard corrupt targets. Don't waste your precious time undoing stuff that isn't critical. The conditional discrimination training rapid learning repertoire is about a generalized repertoire of attending, discriminating across trials, and responding accordingly. It's not about you have to know what a fox is or an elephant, right? So, if it's not your name, if it's your name, you got to teach that. But if it's not that, and it's just one of the other things we were teaching you in order to get to that repertoire of learning to learn, get rid of the target. If you didn't do it in the first place, add in a differential observing response. 
I say dog, you say dog and then find it. You touch it and then you scan it and touch it. Add in that differential observing response because often faulty stimulus control got established because it became unnecessary for the learner to attend to the auditory stimuli or the comparison stimuli. So the differential observing response increases the likelihood that the learner is making sensory contact with the stimuli. And then it could be instructor cues creeped in there. So even though you were doing a lot of the rest, the counterbalancing, there was still that looking at the right one in the array. And that immediately became a more salient stimulus than that auditory stimulus. So eliminate <coughs> the instructor cues. That is, teach them to not glance. And sometimes you actually have to eliminate the instructor. And I'm not suggesting we bump anybody off, but <laughs> I have definitely worked with where someone has done that and that learner is like just they're waiting for it, waiting for it. And what you get is like they'll, they'll wait forever. So you get this prompt dependence. Are you going to look? I'm waiting for you to look. Come on, you got to show me which one's right. You got to look at it. So the learner just sits there and then they start to engage in problem behavior. That instructor is now discriminative for an upcoming prompt that will be associated with reinforcement. So now when that prompt doesn't come, you may see problem behavior or non-responding. So you might have to replace a different therapist. For another child, that therapist who's now not presenting inadvertent cues will not be discriminative for waiting. Okay, so here is a table. It's in this paper. It walks you through some of the most common um, problems and the troubleshooting analysis. Oops, sorry. So let's say the learner is displaying a side bias during the receptive programs. There's a good chance somebody has been doing two stimuli in the array. And so there was a 50-50 shot, right? Increase the array size. If you get a side bias with three, increase it to four. Remember, three is the minimum. The learner's <laughs> responses are influenced by the instructor behaviors. Eliminate the instructor behavior, you know, where you're putting your arm, what you're looking at. Let's say the learner's in switching when the two targets are similar. So separate. So let's say you're having a hard, trouble, a hard time teaching dog from cow when they're in the same set. Well, the issue is you maybe didn't plan as carefully as possible, or there's some feature that made no difference to you, like the shape of the ears, that somehow is over-controlling the child's responding. Separate those two targets that they are not discriminating apart into different, at least three item sets. Teach them differently, long learning history, and then merge them together in a set. Let's see the learner responds prior to the delivery of the antecedent stimuli. Don't put the array out there until you have presented the auditory stimulus. Or put it out there, but it's covered. So one of the things that I'll often do to make it easier for my therapist, takes a little bit more time on our part, I take that data sheet, I put my stimuli in a PowerPoint, and I print out pages, and I put them in a binder. Trial one, cat, learner picks. Trial two, dog. Trial three, snake. Everything's there. All you have to do is flip through the binder and say the correct target. You don't have to worry about I accidentally put one closer than the other. You're not even looking at the stimuli. It's in front of you. The child's looking at it. You have them engage in an observing response and you're looking at the child. So these kinds of things are ways to troubleshoot. Virtually all of them bring you right back to those original best practice recommendations of you've got to be attending to the right thing. <coughs> you want your behaviors and stimuli carefully arranged. You want to prompt and reinforce effectively. That's it. Just as a reminder, the great looking stuff was Laura Grows and the rest is mine. <laughs>